Welcome, I'm Jeremiah Reiner, and this is the Deeply Rooted Podcast. Welcome back to the Deeply Rooted Podcast. We're continuing our breakout sessions of our previous Deeply Rooted Conference that we held this past November. Here's one from our good friend Vern Hall, the pastor of the Free Gift Gospel Mission. I want to thank you all for being here. And I have to let you all know up front that I've never been to a breakout session, much less tried to conduct one. So I have no frame of reference at all for what a breakout session should be. And I've gone back and forth in my mind as to whether or not this should just be a sermon, a lecture, or just kind of an informal conversational type thing. So I've gone the informal route with this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and and uh, ask now that a lot of grace be extended to me if this doesn't meet your expectations of what a breakout session should be, uh, because this is all new territory for me, so thank you in advance for your graciousness. We're addressing assurance in evangelism. Personally, I've been evangelizing for 22 years in one capacity or another. I'm an open-air preacher, often go out and distribute uh, gospel tracts and engage people in conversation, and I'm still learning. I don't have it all figured out. I don't have it all mastered by any stretch of the imagination. There's still a lot that I need to learn, and I am endeavoring each day to learn more. But by God's grace, He has taught me a few things over the last 22 years, and He's given me some experience. So I do pray that I will be able to be a help and a blessing and an encouragement to you today. There are two main headings that I want to cover in this time together, and they are full assurance of effective evangelism and a proper response to possessors of false assurance. Full assurance of effective evangelism and a proper response to possessors of false assurance. And then perhaps maybe there'll be a few minutes at the end if anyone has a question or two. So first of all, let's talk about full assurance of effective evangelism and the perspective I'm aiming for with this is for the evangelist and or the one doing the evangelizing to have assurance in their evangelism. Basically, when you evangelize, I want you to be assured that your evangelism is effective. So first of all, what is evangelism? And I'm going to cite uh, J.I. Packer. Again, I have cited J.I. Packer in the past for his definition for evangelism. If you've studied evangelism much at all, you've probably come across uh, J.I. Packer's definition here. And, and, and he said this. He said that the New Testament answer is very simple. Evangelism is simply preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel. I'm going to go uh, to Romans chapter 1 for just a moment. Romans chapter 1, verse number 16, where here the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So evangelism has to do with the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the declaration and revelation of salvation by Christ. His birth, His, His, His perfect life, His death, His resurrection, His ascension, and all of the doctrines and truths that make up the whole of God's salvation plan. 
Packer goes on and he says evangelism is a work of communication in which Christians make themselves mouthpieces for God's message of mercy to sinners. Anyone who faithfully delivers the message under any circumstance, a large meeting, a small meeting from a pulpit or in private conversation is evangelizing. Since the gospel uh, finds its climax in a plea from the Creator to the rebel sinner to turn and put their faith in Christ, the delivering of the message involves a summoning of the hearers to conversion. If you're not calling hearers to conversion, you are not evangelizing. And the way to tell whether or not you are evangelizing is not to ask whether or not any conversions are known to you as a result of your witness, but it's simply to ask whether or not you are faithfully giving the gospel message. And I'm still on J.I. Packer here. This may not be a verbatim quote, but thought for thought, this is what J.I. Packer says. So you might share the gospel with thousands of people uh, for decades on end and never know of the first conversion. That doesn't mean you're not evangelizing. And on the other hand, a non-evangelistic preacher might speak the message and someone be genuinely transformed. That does not mean that he is evangelizing. So when I consider what Packer said, and more importantly, when I consider what the Scriptures say, it occurs to me that the foundation of effective evangelism is the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. The gospel of Jesus Christ. And sadly, I can recall times when I've been on college campuses that I've personally witnessed open-air preachers who were preaching anything and everything but the gospel of Jesus Christ right. and calling it evangelism. I've heard them preach political ideologies, philosophies of men, personal opinion, and even apologetic methodologies. And none of these things is the power of God unto salvation and the declaration of any of these things is not evangelism. And I'm not saying to you that apologetics has no place in evangelism or that it's never a part of it, but just to merely push an apologetic methodology with no gospel, that's not evangelism. I've seen that happen. I'm not saying that it's never useful to contrast personal opinion or human philosophy with the truth of the gospel when you are engaging in evangelism, but we cannot make these other things our foundation. And sadly, I've seen that happen more times than I care to remember, and I've been guilty of it more times than I care to remember. So when it comes to evangelism, the gospel must be the foundation. We need the gospel. We'll never be assured that our evangelism will be effective without the gospel. Whether it's preaching the gospel publicly, communicating the gospel in a private one-on-one -on -one conversation when you're at work, or handing someone a gospel tract, or any number of other things we might do, it's going to take the gospel for men and women, boys and girls, to be raised to spiritual life. No other message is going to do no other message is going to do, friends. Right, right. John Owen liked to use the word gospelizing. And it's not only for pastors. It's not only for church leaders. Every Christian is to evangelize throughout the course of their day-to-day -day lives upon this earth. And when we do that, God is glorified. When we engage in evangelism, this is how we can have assurance that our evangelism is going to be effective when we are preaching the gospel. Did you catch that? When we're preaching the gospel, our evangelism will always be effective because the gospel always brings results. It always brings results. What do I mean by that? 
Do I mean that when you proclaim the gospel that people will always make an open profession of faith? That when you share the gospel or give someone a gospel track or for you open air preachers, you go and preach on a street corner, does that mean that someone's always going to fall on their face and cry out to God, uh, you know, right there on the sidewalk or wherever it may be? Will they always stand up and say, praise the Lord, God just raised me to spiritual life and now I'm saved? That's not what I mean. That's not what I mean at all. And we'll talk more about viewing results as an indicator of effectiveness in just a moment. But what I mean is this. When the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, those who hear it will either receive it or they'll reject it. They'll either receive it or reject it. And either way, God is going to be glorified. If they hear the gospel and receive it, God will be glorified in their conversion. If they hear it and reject it, well, He's going to be glorified when He carries forth His righteous judgment. So either way, God's going to be glorified. Therefore, when the gospel is our foundation and our evangelism, well, it's always going to be effective if that is your foundation. And we can be assured of this effectiveness because it's based on, it's determined by God, not by results. And I don't know about you, but I find that to be very assuring to me. I find it very assuring because it reminds me that the burden of conversion is not on me. The burden of conversion is not on the evangelist. It's my responsibility to evangelize faithfully, to faithfully preach the gospel, but it's up to God to do the converting. Let me give you a personal thought on how this has helped me. Over the last number of years, I've preached on college campuses, a lot of different settings, multiple states, multiple campuses, courthouses, various street corners, ball games, gay pride events, abortion clinics, and more. I've met a lot of interesting people. And some of them will try to argue with the message. I've had a lot of intellectuals approach for debate, and early on it would concern me that maybe I wouldn't be able to answer their points. Or maybe I wouldn't be able to give a sufficient answer to some question that they might want to bring up. Or, or maybe, you know, they would ask a question and I just haven't had time to study on that topic and I wouldn't know how to respond in a meaningful way. And then it would concern me that if that were to happen, that then somehow my evangelism would be a failure. But I finally learned that success in evangelism does not depend on me being an expert on every topic out there. Success in evangelism does not depend upon the personal abilities of the evangelist. I just need to know the gospel and I need to be faithful to preach the gospel because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is what those intellectuals need to hear. Yeah. Those doctors of philosophy that's what they need. They need the gospel. The college professors, they need the gospel. That's the message they need. I just need to give them the gospel. They need to hear that good news of salvation that is available to them in Christ. My intellect, if my intellect and my abilities were so superior that I could dazzle every intellectual out there and leave them totally refuted and speechless on every point imaginable, that alone would have no converting power whatsoever. It would have no power to give them a new heart. It's up to God to give them a new heart. It's up to God to make them new creatures. For those of you looking for Scripture, 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Behold, old things are passed away and all things are made new. So it's God who makes faithful evangelism effective and He does so 
not according to the will of the evangelist, but he does so according to his own will. And I take great consolation in this truth because it takes the burden completely off of the evangelist. And that's a great thing because I'm not able to shoulder that burden. I'm not able to shoulder that burden. But do you know who is able? God. God is able to shoulder that burden. And it gives me great assurance because when I preach the gospel faithfully, whether God uses the gospel to convert hearers or to harden people, both of those things are successful as far as God is concerned because He can do whatever He wills to do according to His purpose. And He's glorified either way. So if anyone is going to be saved, it's going to be because God chooses the foolishness of preaching to save them which believe. It's God who saves people by the Gospel. We don't. And it gives me great assurance that all true evangelism that I engage in and all other believers engage in, it's always going to be effective 100% of the time. Now, if we're going to be fully assured of the effectiveness of our evangelism, we need to be aware of some false indicators of effectiveness. False indicators of effectiveness. And we touched on this slightly a moment ago, but let me go just a little bit further with this, and I'm going to share with you from my own experiences from open-air preaching. And by the way, I, I do believe open-air preaching would be a very biblical way of getting the gospel out to a lot of people in a relatively short amount of time. Um, there are a lot of bad open-air preachers out there. We don't want to be one of them. We want to be faithful. We want to be gracious. We want to be loving. We want to be bold. We want to be uncompromising. And as an open-air preacher, I just want someone... I just want to be someone who is used of God and reflects the truth of Christ. But open-air pre preaching is just one way to evangelize. Um, and I mention open-air preaching a lot because that covers a large portion of my personal experience. So I'm not trying to paint a picture of open-air preaching as more important than the work of the faithful widow who shares the gospel with the mailman. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. But I can recall going to the University of Tennessee a few years ago with another open-air preacher to do some campus preaching. And maybe some of you have heard me tell this before, but it ended up being the thickest, largest crowd that I had ever encountered while evangelizing. When we got started preaching, there were a few dozen people out walking around, just a little bit of foot traffic here and there, Nothing overwhelming, but then, after we had been there for just a short amount of time, the bell rang, and the classes dismissed, or whatever took place. Something happened, and within just a few minutes of time, this enormous crowd of people just spilled out into a walkway where we were preaching that was maybe twice as wide as this room that we're in right now. And I'm talking about thousands of people. And I'm gen, gen, uh, general, generally, I'll spit it out in a minute. <laughs> I'm usually conservative with my numbers. There were thousands of people, y'all. And so we went from dozens to thousands in just a few minutes of time. And we were preaching and preaching and preaching and they, but we were there heralding Christ and lifting up the name of Jesus Christ and preaching the death, the burial, the resurrection. And we had voice amplifiers. So I know that probably most of them were able to hear some of what was being preached. But if you were to ask me how many of those people, how many of those thousands of people stopped and said to us, you know, I've listened to the preaching here today and, and God has done a work in my heart and I have believed and repented and now I have eternal life. I have to tell you, I don't recall a single person. I don't recall a single one out of those thousands of people who fell to their knees to openly call upon Christ. I never saw the first visible indicator that one person 
in that massive crowd became born again because God used our preaching on this particular day. And there are some people, such as a man by the name of Darius Salter, who would be quick to tell us that our evangelism on this day was a complete and an utter failure. A complete failure. Darius Salter is an author and he's written multiple books, a seminary professor, pastor, at least a former pastor. And as far as he would be concerned, our evangelism would have been a failure. Why? Because there were no indicators that anybody, quote unquote, got saved. Here's a quote from Darius Salter. He said this, Evangelism has failed if it does not result in the evangelized ultimately being seated at the marriage supper of the Lamb. If they're not seated, if it doesn't result in the evangelized being seated at the marriage supper of the Lamb, that evangelism has been a failure. That's an amazing quote. Consider the Lord Jesus Christ. He was an evangelist. The Bible tells us that Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's Luke 19 and 10, if you're looking for Scripture. But when they nailed Him to the cross and He hung between heaven and earth, how many disciples did He have then? According to the thinking of people such as Darius Salter that says that any evangelism where there is no clear indicator of effectiveness, that evangelism has failed. According to this idea, Christ Himself would have been ineffective. But not only so, consider the Apostle Paul. He'd go out to preach and riots would break loose. And he'd be thrown in prison. And all manner of seemingly bad things would happen I suppose that Paul was also an ineffective evangelist during these times. Well, I say today that neither Christ nor Paul were ineffective. Amen. And neither is the faithful evangelist who gives the gospel faithfully to be it few or many. Whether anyone professes salvation or not. Why? Because the gospel is always effective. The gospel is always effective. When the gospel is preached, some receive it, some reject it, and God is glorified either way. Effectiveness in evangelism is not determined by how many people come forward to say, praise God, I'm saved. Now we want people to be saved. Don't misunderstand me. We want people to be converted. We just don't use that as an indicator of effectiveness in evangelism. There's a flip side to all of this. If a so-called preacher goes down to the town square and he starts telling random people, hey, Jesus loves you and He has a wonderful plan for your life. Just repeat this prayer and ask Jesus into your heart and you'll be eternally saved and you can just continue unchanged in your sin. And say, for example, that message goes forth and 500 people respond to that message by reciting an empty prayer, signing a card, raising a hand. It does not mean that that was effective evangelism. Yet sadly, this sort of thing is exactly what we see taking places in many parts of the world today and people are being falsely assured that they are engaging in effective evangelism because they saw certain responses. And they say that these types of responses are indicators of effectiveness in evangelism. Friends, anyone who becomes assured that their so-called ministry efforts are effective and the basis of the ministry or the basis of the evangelism was something other than the gospel, 
combined with the fact that someone signed the card, raised a hand, walked an aisle, recited a prayer, or shook the preacher's hand, that is false assurance. That's false assurance of effectiveness in evangelism. We cannot make these things the basis of whether or not evangelism is effective, especially when we're talking about methods that notoriously produce false converts. Mm -hmm. Even Billy Graham himself stated that he believed only a very small percentage of the people who came forward at his crusades were actually converted. Again, the effectiveness of evangelism is not determined by these types of manifestations. And I'm not even saying that people who walk an aisle or say a prayer, I'm not even saying that they're false converts just because they walked an aisle or said a prayer. The context that I just spoke of was one where the message was, that was proclaimed was something other than the gospel. The day I came to Christ, I walked an aisle and said a prayer. But here's the thing, I didn't understand the extent of the work that God had started in my home. The work that God had already performed by giving me a new heart. But the gospel was preached that day. So there's a difference there, you see. And yes, I walked an aisle. And yes, I said a prayer. But had I never walked an aisle or said a prayer, it would not have rendered the gospel ineffective. And it wasn't the act of walking an aisle or saying a prayer that saved me. Jesus Christ to save me. Amen. Now let's move on to a proper response to the possessors of false assurance. I don't know where we are on time. What time did he tell us to wrap this session up? 3.25. 3.25? Okay, well, we've got plenty of time. You, you guys will probably get done early here. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions or comments about anything that I've said up until this point? Maybe I need to elaborate or I misspoke or I need to clarify something. Any questions? My question is when um, you talked about somebody will start a good solid church closer to you. I'll join you in that. Um, uh, but just something that comes to my mind is to just to keep in mind the, uh, the truth that um, Christ is still an able Savior regardless of where they go to church. And I, I'm, I'm not saying that, that, the, that the local church is not important. I'm absolutely to the contrary. Uh, but uh, really, who, who knows when he does that converting and that regenerating work in their heart, uh, that maybe maybe they maybe they would be willing to drive an hour. I'm not sure. I'm not really sure. Uh, I think, a, I think a, a good solution would be maybe for... Uh, God to burden somebody's heart. And I'm not trying to tell God what to do by any stretch of the imagination, but I will say this. I will join you in praying uh, that there will be a local truth preaching, Bible-believing church um, come into the neighborhood a little bit closer. Uh, but uh, have they told you that they're not interested in going an hour to church? Pretty much? Okay. Well, do they profess to be saved? 
Well, there are, there are several. And all that a different story. It's just like, I think it's long lost scripture that we're praying for. We think that you can get to you. You're praying for the heart. It's a sin to count. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I don't know. I've been driving a pretty good distance to church for 20 years. Um, Maybe he'll, maybe he'll burden their heart to, to, to just go ahead and go until something comes closer. That's about all I know to say about that right now, but I will join you in that prayer. Um, let's move on to a proper response to the possessors of false assurance. And I won't spend as much time on this heading. We talked about assurance for the evangelist that your evangelism is effective. And now we're talking about how to respond to those who have a false assurance. They have a false assurance. And this is important because when we encounter people with false assurance, we don't want them to continue in that state. No, we want them to truly know the Lord. We want them to know the true Christ and have true assurance of their salvation. And there have been many times when I have gone out to engage in some evangelistic effort and I've encountered people with false assurance. I remember one young lady I met at ETSU. I had gone out there to do some open-air preaching, distribute gospel tracts, engage in conversation, and she approached me and in the course of speaking with her, she told me that she was a practicing lesbian. She told me that God, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament were two entirely different gods. And she spewed profanity from her lips, all while confidently asserting that she was a faithful Bible-believing Christian who loved the Lord. And I hope we can all see some immediate problems with her testimony of being a Christian and the glaring issue that I observed when speaking with this young lady is that she had the wrong Jesus. She had the wrong Jesus. And that seemed to me to be the major problem because obviously it's only the true Jesus who's mighty to save. Only the true Jesus. And some other, some other Jesus that a person creates in their own mind, that Jesus would be powerless to save because He's not the true Jesus. So that was a major concern. So what should we do in a situation like this? Well, let me just be straightforward in saying that I've never engaged in a perfect conversation. Never. Not even once. And this conversation was no different. But let me share with you some things that I've learned not to do in an encounter like this. First of all, be careful not to affirm them in their false assurance. Be careful not to affirm them in their false assurance. If you're going to have a meaningful dialogue with another person, you've got to be able to listen. And when you're listening, it, it, it can become very easy to nod your head affirmingly or say, yeah, 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 as they're telling you these things. As they're promoting a false Jesus and a false gospel. And I would say try to avoid that if you can. Avoid someone uh, affirming someone's belief in a false Jesus for many, many reasons. But secondly, don't allow yourself to be distracted from the main focus of going down the, the rabbit hole on points of far lesser importance. If you're evangelizing someone who has false assurance because they've got the wrong Jesus, you probably don't want to go into a 20-minute rant about why it's called the book of Revelation and not Revelations with an S at the end of it. <laughs> The fact that they have the wrong Jesus 
that ought to be a far more weightier matter than whether or not they put an S at the book of Revelation. Amen. I know that's a hard pill to swallow here in East Tennessee, <laughs> but uh, I do believe that to be the case. Keep your focus on the main thing. Keep your focus on the main thing. Thirdly, keep bringing the person back to the gospel. Keep bringing them back to the Word of God, the gospel. Keep bringing them back to the person and the work of Christ. Don't concede any ground. And that's what I kept trying to do with the young lady in bringing her back to the true gospel because you'll be setting their false gospel against the true gospel. And the distinctions then between the two gospels, the true gospel and the false gospel, they're going to be sharpened and then hopefully they'll be able to see that their false gospel of false assurance doesn't measure up to the good news of Christ. And that's what they need if they're ever going to have the assurance that they, that we want them to have. We want them to have assurance. We want them to have, to have true, actual assurance. Assurance of genuine salvation. You know, R.C. Sproul used to talk about those who held a universalist position. Not of justification by faith, but justification by death. And this perspective basically says that everyone will ultimately be saved and then there's justification by works. And this is the belief that in one capacity or another you'll be able to be good enough to merit your own salvation. And it gives people a false assurance because their assurance is based ultimately upon themselves and not upon Christ. We see a picture of this in Matthew chapter 7. If you have your Bibles, let's go there. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 21. Matthew 7 and 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So, in using the word Lord twice in verse number 21, it's done to express intimacy. And this tells us something very alarming according to Sproul. There will be people who come before Christ on the last day not only claiming to know Him, but there will be people coming claiming that they have an intimate relationship with Him. They will have an assurance of their state of grace, but it will be a false assurance because Jesus will declare unto them, depart from me, I never knew you. So when you encounter someone who seems to have a false assurance, Keep taking them back to the Word. Keep taking them back to the Scripture. Amen. Keep taking them back to the true Gospel of Jesus Christ. Just like Brother Mike said here last night talking about counseling. And he had made the point that counseling is not necessarily there for you to solve people's problems. but to focus on Jesus, to get them to focus on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's kind of the same way when you're dealing with false assurance and evangelism. Keep bringing them back to the real Jesus, the real gospel. Because the Scriptures will highlight what is true and make distinct what is false. And of course, pray. Pray for them. You know, prayer is, and, and, I, and I, I've said this before, and maybe you all have as well, or, or maybe you've encountered someone who has said this, 
you're talking about prayer, that they'll say, well, I guess all we can do is pray. No, pr prayer is the best thing you can do. <laughs> it's not just some last ditch effort. <laughs> oh, all we can do now is pray. Well, that's, that's the best thing you can do is pray. You might not be able to stop and pray for them while you're in the middle of the conversation, but pray after the conversation. And, and I hope you would beforehand as well. But once you've taken them repeatedly back to the Scriptures, pray that God will use that to do a work in that person's life. What time is this supposed to end again? 3.25. 3.25? That was what he said. Okay, so we're, we're doing good, right? We're, we're right here within a, minute, a few minutes. Okay, does anybody have any questions about that? Yes, ma'am, I'll try. I don't know all the answers, but I'll try. Well, this is something I've uh, had a lot of trouble with recently. It's kind of a two-part question. Um, as far as being, uh, having assurance, and sharing the gospel. My whole family has, um, well, most of my family, I'm trying to share the gospel with them even though they have been believers for generations, but uh, with false teachings, rampant, of course, in the day and time, I can like that. Is that still considered sharing the gospel if you're doing discernment? as far as trying to share the actual truth yeah, yeah. Uh, the discernment part where it's people that have heard the gospel and I'm trying to share things that I've learned uh, to be true um, they consider that preaching yeah. sorry if that's too complicated it sounds to me like maybe they just don't want to hear it yeah. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I'm, I, I don't see anything in the Bible that would preclude you uh, from share the gospel with your family members. Uh, matter of fact, quite the contrary. Um, a verse in First Peter comes to my mind as, as every man has received the gift let him even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And I don't think that's just talking about males. Um, evangelism is for all people. Uh, you know, that's not to say that you should pastor a church or anything like that. But by all means, your your family they they need the gospel, and uh, if what what based on what you're telling me, when they're, they're they're confused or maybe they're believing things that are contrary to the true gospel, they really need the gospel. They need the, the true gospel uh, set in contrast to their false gospel, and um, I mean it's the it's the power of God unto salvation. So yes, by all means, uh, share the gospel with them, um, and, 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 and of course pray. And I, I believe you you do yeah. pray that uh, God will be working in their hearts, that God would be working on the other end. And um, you know, even if you have family members that are true converts that are genuinely saved, they still need the gospel. You, you don't stop needing the gospel Amen. because you're saved. Amen. Even saved people need the gospel because it's an encouragement to them. We, we see well, the gospel, you know, if someone is truly saved, they're going to see the gospel as an encouragement. We see people all the time when we go out and we try to hand out gospel tracts. No, I'm good. I'm already saved. <laughs> see you later. <laughs> you know, and I, I, I kind of understand where somebody might be coming from if, if, they, if they're thinking, well, I'm, I'm saved, save that for somebody else. I mean, I can kind of see that. I would like for them to go ahead and take the gospel track anyway. Uh, they, they print those every day. 
because the gospel is an encouragement to people who are saved. And if they're not saved, it's the only message that's going to save them. Amen. So um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but I'm, I'm trying to encourage you. Uh, so if, if you're a believer of the true gospel, the true Christ, by all means, share it with them. Amen. They need it. All right. Looks like that's about it. God bless you all. I hope this helped. Thank you all so much for being with us today. God bless you. Bless you.